to the session about uh, zero-knowledge protocols. And uh, the fourth talk is going to be about uh, the existence of free-run zero-knowledge proofs by uh, Niels Fleischhacker, Yipul Guyal, and Abhishek Jain. And uh, Niels will be giving the talk. OK. Thanks for the introduction. So the round complexity of zero-knowledge proofs um, has seen a lot of research over the years. Um, I want to emphasize that Um, Don't worry, it happens every talk. Uh, that I'm talking about uh, proofs here, not arguments. So we're talking about uh, protocols that are sound even against unbounded provers. And uh, we've known a couple of things about the round complexity for a while. Um, uh, Goldberg and Oren showed that two round uh, zero knowledge proofs can basically not exist for interesting languages. The only languages for which you can have two round proofs are in BPP, which are languages where you can verify that on your own anyway, so you don't need a prover. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the result of Goldberg Kahan, which showed that uh, five round proofs do exist for all of NP. In the middle, we have the question. Do three or four round proofs exist for all of NP? And uh, cuts in 2008 showed that if you only look at black box simulation, then actually four round proofs and thereby also three round proofs uh, cannot exist for all of NP. And they can only exist for uh, languages in uh, CoMA. Which still left open the question well, what about non black box simulation? And there's a very recent result from last year at Crypto by uh, Kalai et al. that uh, showed that for public coin protocols, um, under certain strong assumptions uh, on obfuscation, namely that uh, sub-exponentially secure uh, I.O. exists and a special kind of obfuscation called input hiding obfuscation for multi-bit point functions exist, um, they could rule out public coin protocols for any constant number of rounds. Um, in the sense that, again, these protocols can only exist for uh, languages in BPP. <coughs> so this still leaves the question, of course, what about non-black box private coin protocols? Those are not ruled out by any of this. And this is where our result comes in. Um, we specifically rule out three round protocols, even in the private coin and non-black box simulation setting. Specifically, um, assuming sub-exponentially secure I.O., sub-exponentially secure punctual PRFs, and exponentially secure input hiding obfuscation for multi-bit point functions, we show that um, private coin three-round protocols uh, for uh, three-round zero-knowledge proofs can only exist for languages in BPP. This, of course, leads to the natural question, uh, what about four rounds? And uh, we do not expect that our techniques can be uh, extended to four rounds. The reason is that um, there exists a weaker notion of zero knowledge called epsilon zero knowledge, which um, basically um, the simulator is allowed to uh, not simulate negligibly close, um, but there can be, uh, it can be possible to distinguish between the simulator output and the real protocol's output. Um, by a factor of epsilon. And um, this weaker notion of uh, zero knowledge, our result extends to it, which means we also rule out epsilon zero knowledge three round protocols. However, epsilon zero knowledge for four rounds can be instantiated by uh, a protocol uh, due to uh, Bitansky et al. Um, from uh, multi collision resistant hash functions. Now, we don't know, as far as I know, uh, that multi collision resistant hash function can actually be instantiated from standard assumptions. Um, but nevertheless, it's a technical hurdle that would need to be overcome to extend this. So it seems unlikely at the moment. So, how do the proofs, both our proof and also uh, the proof uh, of Kalayada, actually work? The basic idea is uh, one of round compression, which means that we take a three round protocol. And we compress it down to a protocol with fewer rounds. 
Why do we want to do that? Well, the first idea is that um, ruling out protocols with fewer rounds should be easier because it's harder to construct them. So if we can, con uh, can rule out uh, two-round protocols and we can compress a three-round protocol to a two-round protocol, then we've also ruled out uh, a three-round protocol. However, so one might think now that then you're done because if you can compress the three-round proof and we have ruled out uh, two-round proofs by uh, goldfish Oren, then you might think that we're done. The problem is life's not that simple. Um, the fact is that in all of these compressions, if you do round compression, you usually lose the, in the soundness of the protocol, meaning that what you get there is no longer a proof, it's actually an argument. It's um, no longer sound against unbounded attackers. It's only computationally sound. So we need to do, take a different path to uh, get a contradiction. And the path that we take is that, what we show is that if pi, the original three round proof, is sound, then pi prime is a sound argument. But pi prime being a sound argument implies that the original protocol pi is not zero knowledge. And thereby the soundness of pi actually implies that pi cannot be zero knowledge. Unless the language is in BPP that is. Which now leads to the question, how do we actually compress protocols? Um, to compress protocols, we somehow have to remove interaction from it. So how can we do that? Basically, the only way to do that is to somehow move around computation. We could try to move computation from the prover to the verifier to somehow eliminate the first uh, communication step, which seems hard because the prover already uses his witness there. So, or we could do it the other way around. We could try to move computation from the verifier to the prover. And we actually know com uh, compression um, argument that we can use here. Um, Fiat-Shamir, for example, works like that. If we look at uh, public coin protocols, which is where beta is not chosen in some arbitrary way, but uh, where beta is just randomly chosen coins, then we can uh, apply Fiat-Shamir, which uh, basically means we just drop the first message. Instead of uh, sampling beta, what we do is we sample a hash function from a hash function family. We send this hash function over to the prover, and now the prover is able to just compute the proof. Uh, she can compute alpha, then she can sample beta by using the hash function and compute the response gamma and just send both alpha and gamma over to the verifier who can verify this proof. In the random origin model, we know that this, is, this preserves soundness, um, but crucially, uh, Kalei et al. showed that not only is this uh, possible in the random origin model, you can actually instantiate this hash function by uh, using uh, obfuscation and punctual PRFs. Namely, what you do is simply you obfuscate the punctual PRF. Um, of course, so this works in the public coin case. In the private coin case, it's uh, tr more tricky because, well, we do not simply sample random coins here. We do some arbitrary computation. However, if you look at what this actually does, this instantiation of the hash function is, so the verifier, what he would usually do is sample random coins. Well, what does this hash function do? It just samples coins pseudo-randomly. So basically, this is just a de-randomized version of an honest verifier. And if we notice that, then we can actually apply the same thing to a private coin protocol. We can just look at a de-randomized circuit of the verifier, which just samples a random tape pseudo-randomly using a hard-coded PRF key and then just honestly computes whatever the verifier would normally compute. And then just do the same transformation. You drop the first message, you just compute an obfuscated circuit here, you send the circuit over, and now the prover can just compute the proof. So this is the argument. Um, the question is, of course, how do we, uh, how do we prove, using this compression argument, that um, that the three round uh, proof must not be zero knowledge. So we need to prove two things. We have our product original proof and we have our argument. We need to prove two things. We need to prove that the soundness of pi prime actually implies that pi is not zero knowledge. And we need that the compression preserves soundness in the sense of computational soundness. 
the first part of that is actually relatively simple. Um, it follows the same strategy as uh, Goldhatch Orin, actually, with um, some slight modification. Um, if we assume toward contradiction that uh, this protocol would be zero knowledge, then we can look at some arbitrary verifier. So we can specify a verifier. And this verifier, what it does is just uh, it takes an auxiliary input and interprets it as a circuit. And once it receives the first message, it just applies this circuit to the message and sends this back as its response. And at the end, it just outputs the full transcript. By the zero knowledge property, we now know that there exists a simulator that only given this auxiliary input also outputs a transcript that is computationally indistinguishable from a real one. And we can use this to construct a cheating prover against the argument. It's pretty simple. What the prover does is after receiving this uh, obfuscated circuit, it simply runs the simulator on this obfuscated circuit as the auxiliary input. It gets a transcript, and it just sends back alpha and gamma. By the zero knowledge property of the three-round protocol, um, what we have is that uh, this is indistinguishable to the verifier. Therefore, for an x in the language, the verifier must accept. However, if the language is not in BPP, and or well, if this would change, so once we have an x that's not in the language, and the behavior of the verifier would change, this would mean that we can distinguish between elements in the language and elements not in the language, meaning that the language must be in BPP. And therefore, if Pi prime is actually sound. This means that either the language is in BPP or the three round protocol is not um, zero knowledge. However, all of this, of course, hinges on the assumption that this, um, uh, this argument is actually sound. So, is it? And how can we prove that? Um, to see how we could prove that, um, we look at how the prover might be able to cheat. And a cheating prover, at first, the first thing that a cheating prover needs to do is just choose an alpha, a first message on which it wants to cheat. And what we will do is we will define a small subset of alphas that we call bad. And we will show that any cheating prover must, with high probability, choose a bad alpha, as it's the alpha it's going to cheat on. And then we will prove that the, um, the bad alphas actually remain hidden by the obfuscation. The question, of course, is um, how do we define the bad alphas? Again, in the public coin case, uh, which is basically the proof of uh, Kalai et al., um, defining what bad alphas are is relatively easy, because if it's public coin, then we can simply say that any alpha that maps to a, um, that using the PRF maps to a beta such that there exists any, one, any gamma that would be accepted by a verifier is a bad alpha. Now, it's clear that in this case, um, a cheating prover must use a bad alpha because for the other alphas, there is simply no accepting gamma. However, in the um, private coin case, it, this is uh, more complicated because for any beta, there might always be accepting gammas. It's just that what those gammas are might depend on which consistent random tape was actually used to compute this beta. You can imagine a protocol where I, in addition to my normal random tape, I just simply uh, choose an additional random value and if you send me that random value back as your gamma, then I accept. That's an accepting gamma, but you, of course, have no way of finding it because uh, I never reveal anything about this random value. So we need to a more complicated definition of uh, what bad alphas are. But this gives us a hint of how we can do that because the only way for a prover to cheat would be if they can uh, find um, Right, no. Uh, first, the security of the I.O. and the punctual PRF actually hide which random tape was used. So the prover sees, knows what uh, his alpha is, and he sees the beta that the obfuscated circuit spits out. 
but we can show that the security of I.O. and the functional PRF actually hide which random tape was used to compute this beta. What that means is that we can conf uh, define our bad alphas as those that map to a random tape via the PRF such that this random tape leads to a beta such that there exists a gamma that will be accepted by the verifier with high probability over all consistent random tapes. Why does that make sense? Uh, because if the prover has no way of knowing which, random, which consistent random tape was used to compute beta, then the only chance of cheating is to find an alpha such that um, for many, for, uh, that maps to a beta such that for a large number of random tapes, gamma would be accepted. And this means that a cheating prover will output such a bad alpha with very high probability. Or, yeah, with very high probability. Um, we could try to lead this directly to a contradiction with the soundness of the original rerun proof. The problem with that is that at some point we would need to puncture on an unknown point and thereby incur uh, an exponential loss. We can still do that. The problem is that the um, result would be much weaker then because this means that uh, we would need um, a three-round proof that is sound, that has a soundness error that's exponentially small. Only then this would make, still make sense. So instead, we follow the same path that uh, Kalai et al. did and we transfer the loss to a separate primitive. And this separate primitive is uh, what I mentioned before, that's input hiding obfuscation for multi-bit point functions. So what is that? That is an obfuscator that gets as input a point function described by the point and the output on that point, and it outputs an obfuscated circuit, and you want that it's correct, meaning on the point it outputs the output, and on all other points it just outputs bot. And you want that it's secure, meaning that for any polynomial time algorithm, and this is important that it's a polynomial time algorithm, um, given the obfuscated circuit, the probability of actually outputting the point of the point function um, is exponentially small. And this can actually be instantiated, at least in the generic group model, by um, a construction of uh, Canetti and Doug Duke. Um, so it's not a completely unreasonable assumption, and I would argue that probably a more reasonable assumption than uh, I.O. So, um, yeah. So how do we actually use that to transfer the loss? Just a very short sketch of how this would work. The thing is, if we look at a punctured version of the verifier circuit, so where we puncture on some alpha star, if we give this punctured circuit conditioned on alpha star being bad, if we give this punctured circuit to a prover, this cheating prover will output alpha star with a probability that is slightly better than random chance. And this allows us to um, shift this to the input hiding obfuscation by constructing another circuit that basically takes the uh, challenge of an input hiding obfusc obfuscator uh, as an input, or as, as a hard-coded input, and we can use I.O. to switch from the punctured circuit to this circuit because the two are functionally equivalent. And because this um, slight bias over random chance is preserved under that, what we get is that we can um, break the input hiding obfuscator. And thereby, uh, we have that this protocol must be sound because the prover cannot exist. And if we combine those two things, we get our main result, namely that pre-round zero knowledge proofs can only exist for languages in BP, in BPP, under the assumption stated. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd like to answer. Yeah, we have time for questions. Okay, so uh, I have a question. So um, just to make sure there's 
also a positive result here in the sense that you show a general round compression technique. You could take any free message proof, compress it into a two message argument in a privacy preserving way. So that in particular, say that I want now to construct, I don't know, two message witness hiding arguments. It's enough that I will construct a free message witness hiding proof, for example. So the uh, the uh, zero noise or witness line count does not come into the into play in the compression at all. We only need the soundness of the right. So, so this is a general yeah. like yeah transformation would and and privacy preserving. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? So let's thank Niels again.